I'm going to jump right in and talk about music and AI with a subtitle, What Do We Really Want From It? And what do we really want from artificial intelligence? And that's actually a question I think that's for every one of us, right? And, I, and that's a question I think, if there's one question, one thing you take away from this particular session, maybe the question, to keep asking that question for yourself and for the people around you and for the communities that you're part of. What do you want, if anything, from artificial? What do you really, really want, right? So I'll just say, we, yes, we live in interesting times. And this, of course, is that confusion curse. May you live in interesting times. So, um, so this is actually the end of you know, the last time I taught this course, which is actually just back in March of this year. And it was an interesting time to be teaching music and artificial intelligence because ChatGPT just came online not too long ago. And uh, in, in fact, we decided to ask ChatGPT a question that is both AI and music. If it takes an orchestra of 100 people one hour to play a piece of music, how long will it take an orchestra of 50 people? OK, if you know the answer, don't say anything. <laughs> keep, it, keep that answer in your mind. Let's see how ChatGPT does. And I asked ChatGPT 25 times this question. This one says, assuming a piece of music is played at a constant rate, regardless of the size of the orchestra, we can use this concept of proportionality <gasps> to solve the problem. Anyway, this one did some math, ended up with 30 minutes. Was that the answer you got had in your head? No. Uh, what about this one? This one went into the concept of man hours. Uh, and this one is basically like labor. So like I take 100 people this amount to do the same amount of work, then half amount of people, twice amount of time. Makes sense, right? Is that the answer you got? It keeps going. This is seven. Uh, this one ended up somehow at 1.2 minutes. Uh, this one um, is, again, halved. Um, this is an, an amazing statement here. If 100 musicians can play the piece in one hour, then we can say, can we? Then we can say that one musician can play the piece in 100 hours. <laughs> Who needs orchestras? You just need more time. 50 hours for that one. This one, I think, is the most unhinged one I got, which went into some notion of sound energy per hour. OK. Try number 20. This one got the answer I had in mind. I don't know if that's the answer you had in mind, which is like, yes, yeah, the same piece of music, about the same amount of time, regardless of the musicians that play it. And then, of course, I keep going, and here's the last one. It goes back to, to just different answers again, right? Interesting time. Now, this is, this is the older version of ChatGPT, GPT 3.5. GPT 4 will do better on this, but there's something that hasn't changed, some questions that have not changed in terms of like, well, what does this mean, right? Does it actually know? Does ChatGPT actually know anything? And what does it mean to know? What does it mean for us to know? These are good questions. I think these are questions we don't ever have, we still haven't fully answered even for ourselves. And now here is this thing thrust upon us where we have to now confront these questions of knowledge, of information, even truth, all of these things. And well, in this case, I don't know. What do y'all, I mean, what do y'all think? Here's a question. What does it know? I mean, for me, like, I had to tell my mom, like, in spring breaks, like, mom, do not use ChatGPT like you would use Google. They're not, this is not about getting facts, information. It's not about information. It's not even about, it's not about knowledge. It's linguistic forms, mom. It's about generating linguistic forms. She's like, what am I supposed to do with it? Like, write poems? Yeah, you can try to have fun with poetry that, that it generates, or maybe you can draft an email you want to write, but you got to check over that. All right, mom, you got to check over that. It's not the same. Anyway, interesting times we live in. So that's kind of just to give you a sense of kind of where, where I'm, and I'm going to back up a bit and tell you about, a bit about kind of how I've come to find myself kind of in the, in, in the maelstrom here of music and AI. And it's a bit of my origin story. Now, I'm uh, I've, this is my 16th, 16th year teaching here uh, as a faculty at Stanford. Um, I came right out of grad school, which I did in computer science. Uh, and uh, in my undergrad, I was also in computer science. So I come from a computer science background, but my appointment, home appointment in here at Stanford is in music. But then I have a courtesy appointment in computer science. I'm one of these citizens of no place. I don't belong cleanly anywhere. And then I either feel like I don't belong anywhere, or maybe I belong a little bit everywhere. 
And for me, it's really that interdisciplinarity that, that keeps me going and keeps me excited about what I do. I think it, I truly think it's at the verge of disciplines where all the really, really interesting things, interesting questions, interesting things can happen. So, uh, but I'm a builder. I'm a builder of tools uh, and toys and games and instruments, all of these things. And, and, and you know, among them, Chuck, which is an open source, freely available music programming language. It's one of the tools that we teach with. That's the aforementioned Stanford Laptop Orchestra, Slork. Come to our concerts in, uh, in April and May. We have them every, we have them every year. Um, and that's Slork Performing in Bing. That's the aforementioned VR Design Lab. We're asking questions such as, what new instruments can we make in VR? And how might we make music together? And what indeed is real? So I exist in these different modes. So I, there's a lot of tech. I write code. I, I was writing code. I probably wrote code for 50 hours this week because we're my grad student and I were trying to get this product, this software product, this open source thing out the door for our students. So I've been writing code for like decades, literally. I design a lot of things, and it's I'm kind of swimming in technology. You know, parts of it I love, parts of it I'm just as overwhelmed by as, as I think anyone else. Um, but then there's another side of me. This side is just me and perhaps as far away from technology as I can get, All right? And um, so this is 2021 on the John Muir Trail. Anybody been on the John Muir Trail? Oh yeah. How's the, how's the, how's the JMT for those of you that have been on it? Yeah, I, I can, I, yup. 21 days in the high Sierra, rarely dips below 8,000 feet. Um, shower is not really an option on the trail. Mosquitoes are not optional. They're just kind of part of it. And you're, the going, you're not going up a mountain, you're going down a mountain, all right? Like 13 to 14 different mountain passes on the JMT. And I didn't want to go. I love my couch. I love my gaming chair. Why well, do I want to go do that? But maybe it was a response to being indoors for a few years through the pandemic. And, and my partner, Madeline, she said, go, we got to go to the great outdoors. I'm like, no. She's like, yes. I'm like, OK. And then. There we go. She somehow dislodged me from the gaming chair, from the couch, and went into the great outdoors. And it was hard. It was miserable. In fact, when I made a video. In fact, there's a two-hour version of this. I'm going to show you the 50-second version of what it's like on the JMT for two noobs trying to make their way in the wilderness, all right? And now for a taste of things to come. <laughs> yeah, that's a, this is very, it's a very honest video. Um, I'm going to come back to those rocks, because actually they f feature prominently into this talk. The rocks that hurt my feet, the mosquitoes, you know, um, but I'll come back to that. Keep that in your mind, too. But this is all to say, you know, not long ago, the internet was an escape from the real world. Y'all remember that time? It's a different time. Nowadays, I think the real world might just be an escape from the internet. And by the way, that's, that's, that's me on the JMT at Evolution Lake after just a horrendous day of like going up Muir Pass. Uh, there's a thunderstorm trying to outrun, didn't make it. Met the most amount of mosquito I'd ever met in any single day at Wanda Lake. Um, it was cold, it was miserable, but then we got, and then, but if the storm cleared, we got to Evolution Lake, there was a double rainbow. Man, that was sublime. And I would say maybe it would not have been the same if you just like, I don't know, airdropped me to Evolution Lake. Very different. I would still have been like, hey, this is really beautiful. But no, I felt like I earned that that day. OK? Again, keep that in mind. Another side of me is art. You know, we make tools, and then we use those tools to make art, whether it's pieces for laptop orchestra, for VR, and pieces that we incorporate AI in different ways. And for me, like, you know, that's just part of my life. But for me, life 
cannot be separated from the things we do in our work. Whatever you're doing, that's part of life. And for me as a tool builder, life is design. Because we're designing, it's something that's inseparable from this enterprise, this project of tool building. And that's why I wrote the aforementioned book, Artful Design Technology in Search of the Sublime. But then I couldn't just write the book, I had to make it a comic book. Because I grew up with comic books and you know, sometimes the form, form ever follows function, but also form modulates the function. In any case, uh, it's a 488 page comic book about tool building. Asking questions like, what is the nature of design? Who designs? The short answer is, we all do. By virtue of being human, the moment you try to shape some part of the world with an intention, I call that design. What does it mean to design well? That's a different question than how do we not fail at design? Both are important questions. But this book is trying to figure out what does good look like. Three, in this age of so much technology, what does it mean to design ethically? Those are the questions. And it begins and ends with this idea that what we make makes us. The tools that we shape today will come back to shape us. It's a boomerang, right? And so one quick example would be Ocarina. In fact, let me see if I got this demo going for you here. And uh, man, I'm, I designed this back in 2008. I can't believe I'm still demoing it like 15 years later, but here we go. So Ocarina is, a, is an app for your phone. And uh, you play it by blowing into the microphone at the bottom. Boy, a thing. Well, thank you very much. And it's meant to be a kind of a physical thing. And this is Ocarina in gameplay mode. It's an audio, visual, interactive, experiential thing. These uh, circles falling down the middle of the screen is prompting you how to play the next note. But it's up to you. There's no right way or wrong way to do this. So all the sound is generated on the device. It's not pre-recorded. So while this takes a lot of inspiration from games like Rock Band and Guitar Hero, this is also meant to be an expressive kind of a toy where you can really kind of learn to play it in the way that you want to play it. There's a kind of open expression, Ocarina is a virtue. Um, and there's another dimension we can listen to other people around the world blown to their phones. Like, who is that playing? Oh, Shenandoah from the East Coast. I don't know. The app was designed to not tell you. Because if you don't know, you keep wondering. Oh, Indonesia. Legend of Zelda. Who is that? I don't know, I think it's a good answer to just keep asking, right? Who is that? Because the moment you get an answer to that, you're like, okay, I don't know what to do with that information anyway. But it's good to know that there's someone somewhere out there blown to their phone to make music. Why was this designed? Here's another question. Here's a really important question because this gets to the very bottom of technology and tool building for me. It gets to the bottom of things like artificial intelligence and we're, how do we think about this thing today? It's this question not of, not really how or even what. It's this age old question of why. All right. Why was Ocarina designed, you think? Do you think we designed this because we like took a survey and be like, people were building an app? What do you need? What's missing in your life? People like, we need to blow into our phone and make music and, and we need to listen to each other on the globe. Nobody said that. In fact, if I were to confess, nobody, nobody asked for this. And as an engineer whose whole reason for existence is to build tools, this is a tool that solved no problems that seem to exist, <laughs> right? So I guess this is, but this is also its own why. If you, have, if you know that you're, you're not doing this to solve, like to like fill in a hole in the ground, like a hole may be bad, someone could fall in it, it's dangerous, let's fill that up. No, there's no hole to begin with, but it's more like, there's no here, no, no hole here, nobody asked for this, maybe I'll plant a tree. 
and the tree is not really going to be useful in that for a while. Maybe it'll grow to be tall and fine and bear fruit and provide shade. But for now, it's just a tree. Maybe as it grows, it can be a communal gathering place too. But for now, I just like trees. I'm going to put a tree there. I think that's more like ocarina. It's not designed out of need, but perhaps designed out of just, just knowing that something's important to you. In this case, music making, expression. And that's enough to engineer. It's a kind of a strange way to engineer, I have to admit. But that's the only way I know how. It's the best reason, in my mind, to build anything. Is if, you know, well, you, there are a lot of things that out of need we need to address as engineers, as designers, as people. But then there are times where we must, in addition to solving needs, to actually build things that nobody quite asks for, just to, because there's some, it speaks to a different kind of value, all right? And maybe among those values might be this idea that technology maybe isn't just here to solve all our problems or to create wealth, but maybe it could bring us, bring us a kind of calm, a kind of inner peace. What if that was one of the roles of technology? This was left in Ocarina in the App Store back in 2009. It reads, this is my peace on Earth. I'm currently deployed in a rock, and hell on Earth is an everyday occurrence. The few nights of my father, I'm deeply engaged in this app. The globe feature that lets you hear everybody else in the world playing is the most calming art I've been introduced to. It brings the entire world together without politics or war. It is the exact opposite of my life. Deploy U.S. soldier. If you think about it, you know, what is the role of art? It's a different thing for, every, for each person. You know, even one, any one of us can have different ways to answer that because I think art plays different roles in our life. But I think one of the things that art can do for us is to kind of uplift us, even just momentarily, from whatever difficulties and hardships we might find ourselves in throughout life. And some of those hardships can be extreme. And this is all to say good design, I think, should be useful, enables us. But what if we design tools like we made art? And to try to design our tools in such a way that the design, in a sense, understands us. Well, I don't mean this in an automated, like, oh, does this is like AI know what kind of coffee I'm feeling like today? I don't, I, I might care about that, but that's not what I'm talking about here. This is more like understanding, like, like your favorite song might understand you, or your favorite movie, your favorite interaction with a person. Think about that. Think about your favorite songs, your favorite movies, your favorite art. Do they not get you in some way? Who you are, maybe who you were, your relationship with another person? What if our tools and our technology did this? And I don't mean automation. Again, I don't mean AI trying to like guess what I want. I care or I don't care about that. But I'm talking about kind of a human understanding, something that leaves room for me as a person. So that brings me to talking about this course. And, um, and that's... Back to the music and AI, which I taught as a critical making course. It means we build a lot of stuff. We write code, we build things. But the critical part means we're going to think about this. We're going to think as broadly as possible about the implications. We're going to ask the questions that include why. Why was this built? Who is this for? And is this moving us, inching us towards a world we would want to live in? Or is, this, is it taking us away from that? That's the question, right? Lecture one was titled, is this even a good idea? I'm very, I'm very honest with my students. As you can tell, I am with you. I've never met most of you. I'm already sharing my life with you, but I'm all too happy because that's who I am. So with my students, I'm like, is this even a good idea? I'm talking about music and AI. Should we actually be doing AI music even? Just because you're in a class called music and AI doesn't mean we automatically accept that that's gotta be the way it's done. Two, I was actually talking about the class. It was the first time I taught this class, and I was like, yeah, I'm, y'all, I'm not even sure if this class is even a good idea. Thanks for coming. We'll find out together. We say an- quest- answers are great, but questions are greater. Because answers are the end point. It's like in Ocarina. If you knew who's making that music, who's playing, who's playing Final Countdown from Korea, does it even matter? But the question keeps you wondering. And just like the good questions that's been around for thousands of years, if not longer, questions like, what is a good life? (laughs) 
why are you here? These are still good questions because there is not an answer that we can all agree on or maybe need to even agree on, but that question is still good, right? James Baldwin once wrote, the purpose of art is to lay bare the questions that have been hidden by the answers. Think about that, right? What if that was the role of art, is to kind of reverse engineer what the meaning actually was all along? Now that you have the thing in front of you, how did it get here? What does it mean? For AI, this is actually probably even doubly relevant. Because, I don't know, you go to ChatGPT, you go to Stable Diffusion, you go to Dolly, you go to Midjourney, and you just type in a sentence and you got this beautiful looking image, or you can generate a song, you generate a poem, but what does it mean? You got the answers already. What's the question? So you begin to see what this course is about, and also kind of what I'm about in terms of when it comes to music now, and that's why I titled this talk, What Do We Really Want? That's the question, isn't it? What do we really want? from artificial intelligence. And how do we think about that? We had students from different backgrounds. What was really surprising to me was this. Everybody had AI FOMO. What's AI FOMO, you ask? Before I even answer this, how many people in the room are like, yeah, I got AI FOMO? Show of hands, I'll include myself in this. Okay, you, might, you don't even know what I'm talking about necessarily, but I think you know what I'm talking about. AI FOMO is basically, it's like one of my, grad students come up to me and say, Guh, should I have been taking deep learning, machine learning AI classes these last three or four years? I didn't really want to because I just want to make my music. And he's a really good coder. He does a ton of technical stuff. And he's a really great musician. But he said, now that you know, the world's heading in this direction, am I, am I getting left behind? That's AI FOMO. It's AI FOMO that got me to teach this class. It's like, you know what? There's all this AI stuff happening. Should I, I'm a, I'm a computer music prof. Should I be teaching a music in AI class? So AI FOMO was a big part of why I taught this class. But I was surprised to find that most of my students had this. Even if they're engineers, almost especially if they're engineers. It's this anxiety that you might be missing out. It's the fear of missing out on, on, on using AI in your work as if that was like, the fear is that that may be the only way to get valid, to feel validated, right? Anyway, so all my students had it, including the engineers, but everyone else, everyone seemed to have it. Um, and that's a kind of a critical making part. And so I wanna show you some of the things students have built, but I wanna say this, the same thing that I began earlier this talk with when I say what we make makes us, right? It carries to here. And I said to my students, what if we worked with the following idea that every AI system that anyone designs is a kind of argument, a kind of vote, a political vote, if you will, for how we as individuals, as communities, and even as society might want to live with AI. What if that was how would you kept in mind when you went and designed whatever you're gonna design with, with AI for music? Because I wanna see what kind of vote you would cast. I'm very curious about that. And I want you to think about that. So, what do we really want from AI? When you're working on your assignments, I say, do you want a big red button? Do you want a thing? You say, give me the thing. You know, this isn't just music, of course. You know, anyone who likes cooking might still have like automation in their kitchen. But I doubt, I seriously doubt that anyone who loves cooking would be like, all I want is a big red button. Even if the machine could do it better, I don't even know what that means, but even if it could do it better, it's not about the product. The process also matters, right? And a big red button is ever, you know, is really good at skipping that process because that's what a big red button is. Just press me and, give me and get the thing out. Um, I tell students to, to question not just foregone conclusions, but foregone premises, assumptions. Go back, and this is something I would ask all of you, you know, especially in this time when there's so much AI happening on campus on, at Stanford and in the world. It should be worrying. Because some of these questions are, I think, going very, un, some of these premises are going unquestioned. You know, things like, you know, it's, and even that could be automated, should be automated. I see, a, I sense a lot of that in the world today. 
Here's another thing we don't question very much. Progs and AI should be measured by how indistinguishable AI is from humans. A sentiment captured in things like the Turing trap. Is to say, okay, well, hey, this mid-journey can, can, it can generate an image better than I can draw it. Is that progress? It's the question. We should question this. Making things more convenient, less frustrating is always desirable. Can you think of a counterexample to this third one? When is it you want the confusion, the frustration, the inconvenience? John Muir Trail. John Muir Trail. Thank you very much. Exactly. <laughs> Without it, it would not have been the same experience. It would just have been like a pleasant day. What it was was a sublime experience. What else? Learning. Learning. Jessica, you want to unpack that for us a little bit. What about learning? Learning is inherently frustration that through the learning and growth gets maybe untangled and might take a long time. Do you all hear that? Learning is, is a process that is inherently frustrating and I might add confusing. But these elements of frustration, confusion is something that's essential to, to learning, if I can paraphrase. and something that gets resolved as you learn. And to the point where I would question that if, if you're learning, but you were removing the, the, the potential for frustration and, and confusion. My question is, are you, are you still learning? If you never felt confusion, if you never felt frustration, if you never felt the desire to untangle or to resolve or to unconfuse yourself, because you know, all of those make you wonder, make you want to get to the other side, right? Did I miss anything, Jessica, what she said? Okay. Thank you. I would say learning, especially at a time where our education, the way where we teach at every level is being challenged by the presence of generative AI. Right? But I think this is perhaps the most important time to, to kind of figure out what parts of learning and maybe the John Muir Trail or cooking or making music are things that we might need to figure out. What are the things we kind of need to not like, optimize out? Because maybe those so-called inconveniences are actually essential to what we really value about these things. So let's go to some student work. I had a couple of homeworks that I write a controllable generative, but semi-generative, human controllable poetry generator. Second one, I'll, I'll get to these when we get there. So here's a poet of sound and time. This is using a dictionary of words that have been trained to basically for mutual similarity. All right, and, and students are supposed to, so let, let me just go ahead, let's go ahead and play this. It makes sound. It's kind of crawling through this word space. What does this mean? I have no idea. But it's poetry. What's gotten? He's moving up. He's actually controlling where to go. He has no idea where he's going, but he, he, can, he can control the direction. It's got a drum beat. He's teleporting. Oh my god. Who is Susan Reamer at BaltSun.com? I don't know. She just was in this 400,000 word dictionary. There's Susan Reamer at Baltimore.sun. I don't know what this means, but also I don't know because I don't need to know what this means. So that's Andrew at the controls of this like wacky, whimsical, musical kind of a generator. Um, so, you know, there's a lot more to AI than I think this day than, than prompt based or generative. Because this is used in neither of those. And it brings up this idea of thinking about AI. You know, when do we want an oracle? You know, like the ancient oracle of Delphi. You go and ask her a question. She doesn't show the work, she doesn't give you an answer, often a cryptic one, but she's certainly going to not tell you how she arrived at the answer. That's the idea of the oracle. Whereas the tool is something you can learn to use and get better at using. It's like an instrument. You've got to practice it to get better at it. Right? When do we want oracles and when do we want tools? I don't think the answer is obvious, and you've got to kind of think through that at every situation. And uh, this is for the next assignment. I thought I'd give my students kind of like a, this is a, with apologies to the Beatles, is uh, doing similarity retrieval on my voice 
to uh, just fragments from a day in the life. I should have said, with apologies to the Beatles and to all of you, um, but the point here is that you can actually use AI not just a thing that makes the product, but what if we use AI as a thing that can also help you with the process? In this case, it's a real-time thing. That means whatever I do, it's coming right back out at me. And I can then change what I do in real time, and that changes the output. It uses AI uses AI that's actually rather, by this time, pretty old school. But old school isn't bad. It actually means we understand how to use it more. This is using stuff that was like state of the art like 20 years ago, 15 years ago, right? But here we're building instruments, real-time instruments, tools that we can actually learn to use. The Zerto Simons Weka Nature World. This one's using, um, in this program, you're going to use Wekinator, which is, I'll talk about that, to create three interactive AI utilities slash toys in your everyday life. These don't have to be useful. In fact, whimsical is good, absurd is good, playful is wonderful. All right. So uh, this Wekinator is a software framework by uh, Dr. Rebecca Fiebrink, who's one of the world's experts on the intersection of AI, human-computer interaction, and music. She teaches in London, and, uh, and she's been, for me, an inspiration for many other people, an inspiration of how can we use AI in ways that put humans tightly into the loop, right? So you can use Wekinator to do a lot of things, but you can also you can use Wekinator to do very simple things, like, that's all it does. It's been trained just to wave at you. So on this, <laughs> my students went to town. In this rather, uh, in this intentionally kind of a meme of itself, it's kind of a clickbait. It is a clickbait. But it's part of the artistic statement that Matt is trying to make. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll let Matt explain. <laughs> That's all it does. Everyone has to write about what they design. It's part of the reflection. This is what Matt wrote. After a very long and thoughtful writing, this is his last paragraph, so I really enjoyed this assignment. I think it's easy to adopt this toxic, capitalistic mindset that everything you do or make has to be productive or for something. But when we follow that dogma, when we forget to make beautiful things just because they're beautiful, do funny things just because they're funny, or make stupid projects just because they're stupid, there's so much beauty in doing things just because. It was nice to take a pause on life and make something just for the sake of making it and for a grade, but that's more of an afterthought. Right. Here's Angela in a, I'm not sure if this is a tool or a toy or a th whatever it is, but she called it Ohm. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
And so this isn't just kind of pose recognition. It's actually mapping different poses, but also all the intermediate gestures that she's making to sound in a way that she can control in real time. I'll give you one more. This is hand synth. It's actually playable. You can kind of see how the pitch mapping works. So those are just a few of like probably over a hundred different system students design in the course. Uh, what we learned? Well, we learned that this is actually a kind of therapy for our AI FOMO. It wasn't this class so much, but just the camaraderie and the community and also just people making really creative, stupid, wonderful, whimsical, playful things. There was a kind of therapy for that. The course is also running commentary about AI and education. And, you know, and I think where we ended up is that I feel like, well, AI and education, well, it's, it's actually not about intelligence. In fact, I don't know, y'all are, y'all are coming back to campus. Why were you here? And what was, what were, what, what are the things you really loved about being here? What are the things you took away that also perhaps you didn't think you were here to take away? I mean, for me, for my college, and I went to Duke, it was actually things like my Japanese cinema course. I didn't, I had to take it because I was to fulfill like some humanities requirement. I was a computer scientist. But darn, looking back, was that a, I still think about that class. I think about, I think about learning about Ozu and filmmaking and the movie Tokyo Story. It's, it's a movie that, that is about this family, but it's actually not a, it doesn't follow the traditional narrative arc. It isn't about like, there's a conflict, let's resolve it. There's no coming of age. It's a slice of life. And it's like, that's so interesting. Because that's an interesting, fascinating movie. And in many ways, you can kind of see this reflected in the way that I designed that maybe this doesn't have to be about something or for something. It can, we just need to identify what is really valued, what's at stake. And that should give me conviction to at least get started. And also, you know, Stanford. We have a saying as faculty here, maybe y'all, I don't know if y'all heard it when y'all are students here, or if you heard it since. The saying is smart in, smart out. Because no one here, I mean nobody here is like not smart. Y'all so smart. Intelligence is never the question. Then what is the question? Well, <laughs> intelligence we could define as possessing the means to achieve what you desire. That's just a, you know, you don't have to agree with intelligence. It's just a working definition of what intelligence is. But related to this is another word, of course, what some might call wisdom, which we might define as the capacity to critically evaluate your desires in the first place and to value the means that you have to achieve them. Smart in, smart out. Great. But can we go to more for smart in, a little wiser out. And if you took something away that after, I don't know how many years, a few years or many years, I wonder how much of those is not really the smarts, but kind of the ways of thinking, the lenses of looking at the world. Those are things I think are things of wisdom, right? And also uh, on this question of AI, there's, it's, sometimes we talk about like, you know, we talk about these two types of suffering, type one and type two suffering. And we have to wonder if, like, what AI is good for. What do we really want from, from it? What kind of a, what, does, what should it try to address? Now, what is type one, type two suffering? Type one suffering, unfortunately, is the kind of human misery and suffering that has been with us for as long as there's been humans. And we'll, unfortunately, continue to be with us as long as there are humans. And I think you just have to open the news to, be, to know the full range of human suffering that is happening. That's a kind that we wish there's always gonna, should be less of. And then there's type two suffering, which I guess is not really suffering, but it feels like suffering. It's kind of what we, it's, it's the confusion and the frustration of learning. It's the going up the mountain and those damned rocks under my feet. 
I'm not really, I mean, I was suffering. I was miserable. I'm like, Madeline, why did you bring me out here? But I also knew the answers. Like, actually, I want to be out here now. And I look back and I think about those moments of sublimity. And I, 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 my mind goes back to the John Muir Trail. I want to go back. And I know it's going to be hard if I do. But type 2 suffering, I think, is the kind where you sort of are at least buying into. <laughs> it's like, I want to buy. I know this thing is hard. But I want to do it because I think there's something intrinsically worthwhile in it. That I, if I can make it to the other end, I think I will, I will be better for it. I'm, not gonna, I'm probably going to be miserable most of the time. If you all heard of type 1 and type 2 fun, same kind of concept. Type 1 fun is like, this is great. I'm having a great time right now in the moment, type 1 fun. Type 2 fun is you're like miserable in the moment. But in the aggregate, that was a worthwhile experience. That was fun. There's also type 3 fun, which is, is neither fun in the moment or fun in retrospect, but it's a good story. But we're not talking about that. Type 2 fun, type 2 suffering. You know, and I think on this, you know, I, I have to ask, you know, what do we really want from that? What if the whole point of music, of art, is that we make it? I don't know. I'm a, I'm a computer science guy, but I'm also a music guy. And I'm teaching a music AI class, and uh, here I am having this crisis of faith, what some would call. But I have to ask, because I love making music. And... Maybe that word make is kind of what makes making music so musical. What if being confused and frustrated is an essential part of learning anything? You anticipated the slide, Jessica, so perfectly. <laughs> and also, what if all things worthwhile are mountains to climb? You know, what, if, what, if that's, what if those are the things to keep in mind, right? As I look at this, I think about the rocks, but I look at this, and I think about that feeling of being so high and just looking and know that I, 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 I walked up here. Not easy, but man, is it beautiful. So I think to, to wrap up, I, I, maybe, you know, I'm, my, my thinking has continued to evolve. I don't have answers. You know, I think I... Like I said, questions, I think, is, is kind of more my speed. I'm trying to think through them. But I think the way we think about technology needs to evolve, and the way we educate ourselves need to evolve. You know, I think I'm in the minority here at Stanford when it comes to AI and, and learning about AI. Like, I think a lot of classes I see in my own departments don't stop to think about why. And I honestly wish that we, we did more. Because I think we'd all have some really interesting conversations and questions. And I think we'd end up designing and learning different things. You know, I think, because all of this ends up being a vote. You know, how we learn, how, what we build, what we design. Because it ends up being this vote for the kind of people we want to be. And what kind of people do we want to be? What kind of people do we want to educate? For me, it's, it goes back to something I had in Artful Design, which is a pie-shaped person. In higher ed, we would talk about what kind of a student do we want to educate? You know, we're like, well, what we don't want is an I-shaped person, like the letter I, someone who's narrowly focused on one thing. And then we're like, maybe we should have like T-shaped students, which is more like you get some depth, you got breadth. Well, here's the pie-shaped person here. All right, what's a pie-shaped person? Well, on one leg, I would say you learn something about disciplinary expertise. For me, that was computer science. Other leg, domain expertise. For me, it was music, but for others, it could be like public health. But this bar on top is what I call the aesthetic lens. It's the philosophical, artistic, and moral lens that gives broader meaning and context in bridging the two legs. And isn't this more of who, not just who we want to educate, but who we ourselves may want to be? I'm trying to be a better version of this pie, I think, every day. You know, if students look at me and they think I know stuff. I thank them for having that, that impression. <laughs> but the truth is, <laughs> I, I'm on my own journey of learning. And I'm so thrilled that I get to do it in this wonderful place. And I do it with my students. But I, I'm, I'm on this journey. I'm trying to figure it all out. I have no answers on AI. But I have a lot of questions, right? Because questions are greater than answers. I'm going to read you just a few things. I know we're running out of time. 
So I'm going to skip over some of these. These are actually available on the website for the course. Um, some of these I should read. This is from Julia. She's a computer science master's student. She says, my area of study within CS is specifically on machine learning, artificial intelligence. I've previously taken many ML and AI classes and worked on research in these fields. In these past experiences, I was concerned with the theoretical and technical details of how to design and train an ML model. My goals were to achieve or surpass established state-of-the-art benchmarks. How can my ML models be better? How could I tune my model layers? Where could I get more data? These are the types of questions that I was always trying to ask and answer. However, taking this class has made me take a step back and consider why I am working in this field and what this is all for. Thinking about all this has led me to have more questions than answers. But, for, but one of the greatest takeaways I have is that AI is, quote, and this is what we've been talking about in class, astoundingly competent most of the time, some of the time. But humans, Julius writes, are astounding. After a quarter of seeing and experiencing the sheer range of creativity that has been produced from this class, I feel secure in knowing that AI is a long way away from ever achieving anything close to the projects that were created for this class. Everyone started from the same basic idea, and yet they all went in wildly different and creative directions that I could never have imagined. The funny thing is that I've learned that AI doesn't necessarily have to ever achieve this. And to end, this is uh, from Andrew, the one with the poetry earlier. To include, I'm grateful to the class for providing a supportive environment to experiment with AI in creative and unorthodox ways. Like many, I felt AI FOMO at the start, worrying over how I could incorporate AI into my research as if that were the only way to feel validated. But now, after 10 weeks of using AI to make utter ridiculousness, he made all these completely whimsical, playful things, I'm over it, he writes. I'm tired of bending over backwards to try to make it work in creative and scenarios, it means AI, where human skill and sensitivity feels more natural. AI has been firmly dislodged in my mind from being the holy grail that many have presented it as. It's honestly a huge relief. But wait, now that the expectations have been let go, do I find myself feeling excited again, maybe even hopeful? Whatever the feeling is, it's not obligation or FOMO, nor is it aversion. If and when I do use AI again in my work, I'm confident it will be because I want to, not because someone says I ought to. I won't slam, this, I won't slam shut the door to AI, just like I won't leave it wide open. Instead, I feel confident, content now to remain open-minded, hanging tight to that oh-so-important question, what do we really want from it all? So I will end with just a verse from the Upanishads, okay? You are what your deepest desire is. As is your desire, so is your intention. As is your intention, so is your will. As is your will, so is your deed. As is your deed, so is your destiny. This question, what do we really want, is of course a question of desire. And the importance of desire is because what, if you can figure out what those are and why you want them, you can evaluate those, I think it gives you the tool to chart the course as much as we can in a time of, of ever greater uncertainty to hopefully shape something about our destiny. Right? Isn't that design in the most fundamental sense? But to do design well, don't we need to actually get back to the root? And maybe that root is kind of what we want from all of this. What we make makes us. So I want to thank you all very much.